She was a keep fit enthusiast and she would often leave her home, which is only a minute's walk from Burnley Road towards here, the coppice in Accrington. And it was around 4 p.m. I think it was the 12th of August 2019 when she made one such visit to the coppice. And this is where we are now. Now, the walk she made, there's two ways around this, this area. There's this one, which we're on now. And as you can see, there's a bit of an incline. And I think it's called the Cardiac Hill. So this pathway is the Cardiac Hill pathway. And there's an alternative route, which takes you around that direction, around that side of the coppice, and back down here. But I've done some research and I've asked a few people online if they know where Cardiac Hill is and a lot of people seem to say it's this side. Now if we are wrong, please comment down below. But it was more certainly at around 4pm, like I said on the 12th of August, when Lindsay would leave the house to do what she'd done many, many times before. And that was to make this short walk along the coppice. Now as we make our way up what we think is Cardiac Hill and retell the story of Lindsay Burbeck. We'll also mention the names of a few witnesses that afternoon. People who saw things out of the ordinary. Our lady who would become a witness and testify of seeing a strange looking character lurking around these woods and as you can see as I pan the GoPro around it is a secluded area now there is quite a few cars in the car park like I said which is down at the bottom and as yet we've not encountered anybody but it was here like I said on the 12th of August just after 4 p.m. in the afternoon Lindsay were making her way, or she was making her way up along this path where my wife and two daughters are currently walking. Now also that afternoon was a couple called Judith and Martin Bibby. And them themselves, they had ventured out over to the coppice to walk the dog. And by the time they arrived here and made the steep incline, like I said, up a pathway known as the Cardiac Hill, they reported it being around 4.15 when they noticed a red garment or some form of fabric and it was attached to a barbed wire fence. Now they also would later testify in court that they thought they heard a voice coming from the same direction but they thought it was nothing more than kids messing around playing in the bushes and playing in the woodland so they didn't think too much of it and just carried on with the walk. Now obviously, to this day, nobody I think is sure or I can confirm that the garment that they'd seen on the barbed wire had belonged to Lindsay Burbeck. On the day of Lindsay's disappearance, she had been out that, that day with her daughter Sarah and her daughter's boyfriend called Brandon. And I think it was in the mall over in Blackburn where they had visited before coming back to Accrington. And I think it was Asda they were seen in shopping. Now, Sarah and Brandon later on that afternoon had arranged to meet Lindsay. And I think they were going to go out for a meal or, or have some tea at Lindsay's house. But they planned to meet up. But when they arrived at Lindsay's house at five o'clock, there was no sign of, of Lindsay, but everything seemed normal and not, nothing out of the ordinary. Now at the top of Cardiac Hill, the pathway I should say, is some fencing. Now whilst it's not barbed wire fence, in the term of barbed wire, as you can see it is just a metal fence. Was it this fence where they saw the red fabric fluttering in the wind? And was it down the embankment where Lindsay and maybe her killer was at the time? Because it is quite secluded just down this ridge here. Now, I'm not for one minute saying this is the area where Lindsay 
and the attack took place. None of us will know where that took place, apart from the police and obviously the forensics at the time. So we're not, we're not saying for definite this is where the attack on Lindsay took place, far from it. But what we are saying is there is metal fencing around this area and it is at the top of Cardiac Hill. So perhaps this is where the witnesses, the Bibby family, when they were walking the dogs, noticed the red garment fluttering and where the noises were coming from just further down an embankment. Like I said, it's very hard to say for sure. Now after Sarah and her boyfriend Brandon had arrived at Lindsay's house and there was no sign of the mother Lindsay, I think they left it for about an hour before Sarah phoned her father Tim just to ask if, if he knew where the mother may have been. Now Tim and, Tim and Lindsay, I should say, now they'd been separated for quite some time but stayed in contact, they were still good friends. So it wasn't unknown for Tim from all accounts not to keep in touch obviously with Lindsay and obviously keep in touch with his children and what was going on in all his family's lives. Even though they were, like I said, they were separated, it wasn't uncommon for him to know such things. But on this evening in particular, he hadn't heard anything from Lindsay and obviously he was unaware as to Lindsay's disappearance. Now he arrived at Lindsay's house just after seven o'clock in the evening. He, um, he tried to phone Lindsay, he tried to phone her. But again, there was no answer. Nobody was picking up. Now after Tim and Sarah had alerted the police to Lindsay's disappearance, the police would instigate a missing from home person's case and they would concentrate their search over here on the coppice. Now over the course of the next 11 days, nothing of Lindsay would ever be found. No whereabouts, no clues, nothing. And it seemed that the police were quickly becoming frustrated with this case, despite massive appeals, radio appeals, posters being put up in and around the town of Accrington. Everything they were trying was drawing a confusing and frustrating blank. Yeah, Lindsay is still not been uh, identified or found, um, and that's the reason why I speak to you now, is because I'm appealing to anybody who may have seen Lindsay. Lindsay's now been missing for seven days, so she misses the 12th of August around about 4 p.m. to half past four when she was last seen entering the area of the coppice. Now, I'm keen to speak to anybody who may have been in the area of the coppice and possibly seen Lindsay, um, or even possibly seen Lindsay exit the coppice area or seen her in the times in between. We have, just to reassure people, we have been had multiple uh, officers working on uh, trying to allocate Lindsay. So we've had people, search teams, especially search advisors, helicopters, drones, dogs, had a multitude of resources trying to find Lindsay, supported by a number of detectives. Now, four days after her disappearance, the police released CCTV footage showing Lindsay walking along Burnley Road at around 10 past four in the afternoon. She was wearing a purple bubble jacket, black leggings and dark coloured trainers. More footage would soon appear showing Lindsay heading towards, I think it's Peel Avenue, which is close to the entrance of the coppice itself. And it's the entrance to where we have started today's video. On the 27th of August, police would release CCTV footage to the public via news outlets all along national television. And this CCTV footage, which was recorded on the 17th of August, five days after the disappearance of Lindsay, it would show a young boy dragging a blue wheelie bin along Burnley Road at around 2.30 in the afternoon. Now, what makes this footage so important? It was the fact that a blue wheelie bin had been seen by several witnesses prior to the discovery of Lindsay's body over in Accrington Cemetery. The footage showed this young boy, and it would later emerge his name would be Rocky Marciano Price. And I think he was 16 years old at the time, and he lived in nearby Greenbank of a man who they are treating as a suspect in the hunt for the killer of mother of two, Lindsay Burbeck. The video shows the man walking down Burnley Road towards Accrington at half past two on August the 17th. That's five days after Lindsay went missing.
So who was Rocky Marciano Price? Well, he was, like I said, he was a 16 year old boy. Now he had struggled with autism and ADHD, as well as suffering with a low IQ of just 65. Now he was placed inside an alternative school over in Barn Oldswick, and this was set up to help children with special needs. Now, from all accounts, Rocky himself would spend several afternoons a week attending the school, but he was, well, he was well known for being a quiet sort of lad, but he barely engaged in any conversations with his peers. Now, one could argue for all of Rocky's dis disabilities, such as obviously ADHD and autism and his low IQ, he still had a, had a fondness for many things. By all accounts, he loved playing on his Xbox. He loved to use, watch in Western movies. Uh, I think he also enjoyed looking after the family chickens. I'm sure I've read that somewhere. So he was, even though a low IQ, he was still an intelligent boy. But like I said, he also looked much older maybe, and one could say a lot more physical in his appearance than what a 16 year old normally would be associated to look like. After the CCTV footage had been shown on national television, his own parents would escort their son Rocky to Greenbank Police Station. And it would be three days of intense questioning that would result in Rocky being charged with the murder of Lindsay Burbeck. It was on the 2nd of September 2019 and after three days of intensive grilling by the Lancashire Police, Rocky Price would be charged with the murder of Lindsay Burbeck and he would appear at the Blackburn Magistrates Courts. However, those charges would soon be transferred over to the Preston Magistrates and it's there where Rocky would spin a web of lies and deceit and he would try to implicate this fictitious character of whom he met up here in the coppice on the day of Lindsay's disappearance. He would tell the police and he would tell the court and the people listening or who he thought were listening to him that he would often he was offered I should say a lot of money to dispose of Lindsay's body. Now the one thing which kind of blew this out of the water is every time the police and the prosecutors questioned Rocky on what this stranger looked like, what this character looked like, he just gave basic a kind of basic interpretation in his own mind of this fictitious character that he created. He would never give a name. He said he'd never met this guy before. So obviously it became like an implausible theory that some stranger were gonna offer another stranger a lot of money to dispose of a body. It just seemed completely illogical. Now, when I say that, obviously, the description Rocky gave to the police about this fictitious character was basic, it was basic. He simply said, he was a white man who spoke in a white sounding accent. He'd never met this guy before. So you can see what I mean by Rocky trying to spin a web of lies and trying to clear his name from the murder of Lindsay Burbeck. Now obviously the police didn't believe any of this at the time. Uh, they would, like I said, three days of intense grilling and they would really put the pressure on Rocky to admit to being behind the death of Lindsay Burbeck. Rocky, even to this day, as far as I'm aware, maintains that he never killed Lindsay Burbeck and that it was the stranger in this coppice, where we stood right now, who had approached him and offered him a lot of money to dispose and conceal the body of Lindsay Burbeck. But like I said, the police themselves just weren't going to be fooled by any of this nonsense. Now obviously, with Rocky coming out with such fabrication, the police would still have to look into what he was saying, obviously to dismiss it fully. And they view hundreds and hundreds of hours of CCTV, but no person who matched the description Rocky gave to the police was seen entering or leaving the coppice at any point on the day Lindsay went missing. Now on the day of Lindsay's disappearance, an important witness came forward by the name of Zoe Braithwaite. 
and she herself had entered the coppice here where we are now at around 3.45 p.m. like I said that very same day now she quickly became aware of a strange character and he was between three and five meters away on a parallel path toward the one she was walking on so maybe she was walking along here and the path was just three or five meters in that direction say but he was acting in a weird manner he was wearing a black hoodie he had the hood up all the time with his hands in his pockets she remember seeing some facial features but not too clear so she told the police it was around 20 to 25 years old and i think this is where i imagine why i think rocky looks older than his age of 16. even one witness put his age at 20 to 25. now zoe she kind of felt a little bit threatened after all the time of year it wasn't overly cold it wasn't miserable the weather wasn't miserable but yeah it had this strange character seemingly lurking only between three or five meters away from where she was walking so she slowed down and she let this character carry on walking ahead and for her own peace of mind she would take a different route to the one this strange character was heading into now she would tell the police that at one point she estimated that this strange character had traveled between 100 120 meters ahead of her so she felt safe at that point but after a short walk around the coppice and as Zoe was leaving at one of the gates near the bottom she heard and she saw again this strange character now this time he was only between I think 30 to 50 meters away from where she was so obviously she presumed that this stranger must have run to get closer towards Zoe at some point when they split up and went their own ways he must have changed direction and then ran towards where Zoe was so he made they made the gap up so she picked up her a large stick something heavy to defend herself with something was telling her something wasn't right with this character now fortunately for Zoe she managed to get out of the coppice safe and well albeit slightly shaken up I would presume the same couldn't be said for poor Lindsay Burbeck who entered the coppice shortly after at around 10 past 4 that same, that same evening now as for the wheelie bin this plays an important factor in all of this now the jury would hear that Rocky himself had visited the coppice on where we are today at least three times on the 12th of August and obviously the same day as Lindsay's disappearance the first time was around 2.27 p.m before he reappeared next to the Whitaker's Arms public house and that was around I think 20 past six in the afternoon so he was up here for nearly four hours or just over four hours I should say now his tracksuit that he was wearing was partially unzipped with his hood covering his head and his knees appeared wet now at around I think 6.49 p.m. it was then seen emerging from the brambles at the rear of Isothane on Newhouse Road and walking up Whitewell or Whitwell Road with a black rucksack on his back making his way again towards the coppice 50 minutes later Rocky was then seen emerging from the direction of some grassed area on Burnley Road and he still had the rucksack with him he then entered Ackerton Cemetery before exiting through a side gate onto Whitewell or Whitwell Road and in the direction of his home later at around 8.28 p.m. He would, he would again be seen on CCTV now this time he would be carrying or pulling I should say the wheelie bin now Anthony Dewhurst who was walking up Burnley Road or the same side as the Whitaker's Arms pub he saw Rocky with this wheelie bin and according to Mr Dewhurst it sounded hollow and this is what we were saying earlier he would be seen on CCTV one minute pulling a bin which seemed to look like it was empty then on some more footage it seemed like he was lugging something heavy around at 11.18 p.m. that evening, Rocky had left the coppice to make his way into back, well, back into Accrington Cemetery and he was still carrying the rucksack but he no longer had the blue wheelie bin. Now over the course of the next few days, I think the next couple of days, 
Rocky Price would be seen on CCTV again walking along Burnley Road and into the direction of the coppice. Now it was argued by the prosecution that Rocky had by now disposed of Lindsay's body inside the wheelie bin and he had left it hidden somewhere within the coppice. They would also say that Rocky was doing a dry run for what was to eventually happen on the 17th of August and the burial of poor Lindsay's body. Now it was on the 17th of August that Rocky again would be captured on CCTV pulling a wheelie bin, which this, uh, this time it seemed to appear heavy. And it was around, I think, 10 to two in the afternoon and along Whitewell Road. And I think he was heading towards the cemetery at this point. Now again, the prosecutors would, would argue and would say in court that it was more than likely that Lindsay's body was indeed inside the wheelie bin at this point. And Rocky, like I said, he'd be making a few dry runs to and from the coppice, basically to see which path would be the best and safest option to go without being caught. Now, Rocky would eventually take the wheelie bin to Accrington Cemetery, where we're heading towards now, and to the disposal of Lindsay's body. Now, in the days after Lindsay's disappearance, the whole neighbourhood and the old town of Accrington and nearby places such as Hapton and Huncourt and Burnley all came together. Massive such parties were instigated. Fields, rivers, streams, houses. Indeed, the coppice was searched, but there were no sign of Lindsay. Posters were put up on nearby lampposts, on buildings, inside post offices. TV shows, or I should say TV news outlets, were talking about the disappearance, but yet nothing was ever seen or heard of Lindsay. Now we know that on the 17th of August, and at around 3.50 p.m. Rocky Price brought the blue wheelie bin back along this pathway here because it does lead us to the side of the Whitaker's Arms pub. And he was caught on CCTV passing this area. And I presume it's by one of these houses, if not the Whitaker's Arms pub itself. But it was most certainly seen coming this way like I said, with the blue wheelie bin. And it's at this point along this pathway, we feel that that wheelie bin in, did indeed, it contained the body, the lifeless body of Lindsay Burbeck. Now it is very difficult to imagine that Rocky made his way this way with the blue wheelie bin. It's so uneven underfoot and it's so narrow that the, the pathway itself, and as you can see about the unevenness of it, it would have made such a noise being dragged through. Even though it would contain the body of Lindsay and it would have been heavy. And that again, that would have made it even more difficult. You can see tree roots coming through. How narrow and how, like I said, how uneven this pathway is. But it was definitely caught on camera coming this way. And at the end of this path here, he would have taken a left on the Whittaker's Arms pubs there. So it would have took quite a lot of effort to come this way. Now, we have walked along the coppice and to tell some of this story, part of the story today. And we did encounter a lot of people. So that's why you probably would, or you probably will be seeing a lot of cut scenes in this video today. And we are going to try and uh, line them up, the shots up best we can. But this bit of stretch, or this stretch of pathway, I should say, we've not encountered a single person. So I can understand why Rocky came this way. But perhaps, like I said, it probably would have been the more secluded. We have not encountered a single able-bodied person yet coming this way. But it's just the, um, the unevenness of the path itself, which kind of confuses me because the effort it would have taken to, to drag a wheelie bin with such weight in along here it would have been an an, a massive effort. So after Rocky had exited this pathway and alongside the Whitaker's Arms pub, he crossed Burnley Road and into Accrington Cemetery. And this is where we're gonna to head towards now. And we're gonna take you guys to the area where Lindsay's body would 
sadly be found. And I think it was some 12 days after her initial disappearance. Now, as we come to the end of this path, the Whitaker's Arms pub, like I said, is on the right hand side with Burnley Road just in front. So, like I said, he came down this way, did Rocky with the blue wheelie bin, crossed the road, and he entered the cemetery. It was on Sunday, 18th of August, when a lady, I think she was named Christine Alderson, and she was walking along Accrington Cemetery with her daughter, as well as the dog that they'd taken for a walk. And they came across a bloodstained tissue that was on some patch of grass somewhere, somewhere around here. Now, she said at the, at the hearing of the court, that the blood on the tissue looked fresh and it looked bright red, like it might have belonged perhaps to some homeless man or somebody who maybe just had a nosebleed or, or something like that. So she didn't really take too much notice of it. But then other witnesses came forward. I think it was on the 19th of August when another dog walker was making his way through, through this area. And this is when the wheelie bin comes into, into effect. And it was... I think it was a chap called Jason, or Jason Forshaw. He would, he encountered this blue bin, like I said, seemingly out of place here in this, in this cemetery. Now he went and actually checked the wheelie bin and when he lifted the lid, it was empty. It was completely empty. And this plays a, an important clue as well. And then there was another man, Daniel, or Daniel, or Daniel Westall, who was participating in one of the first funded searches for Lindsay. And he also noticed the blue bin here in the cemetery, as did Police Constable John, I think it's Cuthbertson, who came across the wheelie bin the following morning on the 20th of August. So one could say there was plenty of witnesses on the 19th and 20th of August who encountered a wheelie bin here in Ackerman Cemetery, and it seemingly looked out of place. Now that same evening, around 9 p.m., three ladies were walking through the cemetery and they noticed, or one of them noticed a blue bin as well. But she would later describe at the hearing that it looked like there was some kind of reddish stain or brownish stain on the outside of it, but they didn't really pay that much attention to it. It might have looked out the way, out the ordinary, but it was a blue bin at the end of the day. But there was another guy, and I think it was called Jonathan Kell or Jonathan Nell, who was walking his dog, Oscar, again, in these parts, and in that direction just over there, and that's where we're going to go to now. But he was walking his dog, Oscar, and he noticed some blood on his pet dog. Now, obviously, he thought Oscar had trodden on something and perhaps cut its paw or cut its leg in, in the brambles, in the bushes. So he wiped some of the blood away, and like I said, it seemingly looked fresh. Now, when he got the dog home, um, he checked over, he checked over the leg and the undercarriage of the dog. There was nothing untowards. The dog looked absolutely fine. So, again, he kind of shrugged this off. Now, it would be on the 24th of August, some 12 days after the disappearance, that the news that nobody wanted to hear would finally break, and that, that was the discovery of Lindsay Burbeck's body. Now, where we're stood now and where we're going to now is where Lindsay's body would be discovered on the 24th. And where we are now, we'll try and line up a few shots, but the police, once the body was discovered, the police will quickly descend on this area. And we have photographs of tents being placed up in this direction, police cars on the path just going down here. Um, you have forensic people floating around over there. And that is where Lindsay's body was found. And like I said, we'll superimpose some photos over this part now, and you'll see exactly what we're, what we're looking at now. Now, 
Now, Accrington Cemetery, it's a well-known place to bring dogs. We brought our own dogs here to take them for a walk quite a few times, but it is a well-known and it's a common place for dog walkers. And like I said, it was on the 24th of August when a man by the name of Morgan Parkinson had brought his dog here, like I said, to take it for a walk. And it was in the woodland area, the wooded area of the cemetery, which you guys can now see in front of us, where he had taken his pet dog. Now, as it was walking along this stretch and just over there, his dog stopped and it seemed to be sniffing around at the ground. And when Morgan shouted over for his dog to, to come over to him, the dog just wouldn't move, it just wouldn't budge. So Morgan made his way over to the area where his dog was. And as he got closer to the dog, Morgan recoiled at the horrible smell that uh, seemed to permeate the air. Now Morgan pulled his dog away from the spot where it was fixated with and he noticed hundreds of flies apparently swarming around that area. There was a plastic cover on the floor where these flies just seemed to be placed and there were, there were literally hundreds if not thousands of them. Now upon further inspection when Morgan or Morgan, I should say, investigated and looked at the area. That's when he noticed something that appeared to be a human leg. This was around 7.23 p.m. in the evening on the 24th of August. Monday, the 12th of August, Lancashire Police have been involved in a missing person investigation looking for Lindsay Burbeck, who is a 47-year-old lady from Ackington. At about 8 o'clock on Saturday evening, we received a call from a member of the public and police officers and detectives attended Accrington Cemetery. But there, sadly, we found the, uh, the body of a woman. And as a result of our investigations regarding that, we've now launched a murder investigation. Whilst we've yet to formally identify the body, we believe at this stage that it is Lindsay. And we have informed the family of all the developments and family liaison officers are with them. What I'm asking for really is to appeal to the public. If you can cast your mind back to Monday the 12th of August about 4pm, that is the last sighting we have on Lindsay walking along Burnley Road in the vicinity of Peel Park Avenue walking towards Atkinson Town Centre. So I'm asking if anybody was in the area at that time, please contact us. If anybody had seen Lindsay on that date or since, again please contact us and let us know. And if you have any CCTV within the area of Burnley Road and Peel Park Avenue, again, please contact us. And then, with regards to Accrington Cemetery, anybody within the last two to three weeks who's seen any suspicious activity or anything untoward within the uh, cemetery or the surrounding area, or if you've got any CCTV that covers the area of the cemetery, again, please contact us to help us, help us understand what's gone on and try and identify now we're obviously shocked with the discovery, the grim discovery of what looked like a human leg. Morgan tried to contact the police to report the finding, but for whatever reason he just couldn't get through to them. So he telephoned his wife Sarah, who herself promptly made her way here to the cemetery. Now she arrived at around 7.42pm, and after confirming what her husband had found, Mr Pogerson again called the police, and this time he managed to get through to someone. Now PC Robin Say attended the cemetery at around 8pm and was led to this area where we are now by Mr Parkinson. Now PC Robin would later say in court that she saw a shallow ditch with a mound of soil in the middle. It had looked artificially obscured underneath undergrowth and this section that had been disturbed by Mr Parkinson's dog was some plastic and she could see what looked like pale skin. Now, as you can imagine, a murder investigation was officially launched, and as crime scene investigators attended this area, the following morning, um, a yellow-handled saw and a pair of green heavy-duty gloves near Lindsay's grave were both found, which both tested positive for blood. Now, that area was just around here. Now, obviously, this whole area was quickly surrounded by by police and it was cordoned off from the public. 
and indeed a body was found just where I'm pointing at now. Now the body was taken away and a post-mortem was undertaken by, I think it was a Professor Naomi Carter or Dr Naomi Carter and she would later testify in court that the injuries sustained to this lady, Lindsay Burbeck, this poor lady, were the worst that she'd encountered in something like 20 or 25 years of her being in that line of work. Now Lindsay herself had suffered from a crushed throat, a crushed neck, but it was so severe that the actual neck itself was pushed that far back, it was actually on the vertebrae, on the spine if you will, on the neck bone. She'd also suffered some horrific mutilations towards some parts of her body and it looked like some part or a portion of her leg had tried to have been hacked away. Now, it seems likely now that Rocky Price had tried to dismember Lindsay's body before putting her into the blue wheelie bin. And all the times that he was seen walking up and down the coppice with the blue wheelie bin and along Whitewell Road and along Burnley Road, they were dry runs. He was doing that so he wouldn't be seen. He knew which paths and which routes to take. To make matters worse, at some point in Lindsay's disappearance, he had tried to dismember her. He had tried to cut part of her, of her leg. And I think it was away from the knee. It was unsuccessful. So he had basically put Lindsay's body in the wheelie bin. And I think from all accounts, he had placed her in the wheelie bin upside down. So all the blood had gone to the head and not obviously the feet but the injuries were so horrific and so brutal in nature this wasn't an accidental crime it wasn't manslaughter this was pure pure murder but why why would rocky price commit such a hyenas act on an innocent defenseless woman and on somebody who he didn't know not neither lindsay or rocky knew each other so just on this corner here and around here is roughly where poor Lindsay and her body will be found by Morgan and his dog like I said on the 24th of August it was a makeshift grave she'd been crudely dumped here with a plastic cover over her not much attempt made to conceal the body at this point so whether or not Rocky was supposed to be coming back to to make the, the hole slightly bigger to bury Lindsay we'll never know but this is most certainly where we are now, guys. This is most certainly where Lindsay, unfortunately, was found dead. Now, as for Rocky and his tale of meeting a stranger in the coppice and being offered a substantial amount of money to dispose of the body, he maintained that all the way through. And I still think to this day he maintains he never killed Lindsay. A lot of accusations, therefore, were thrown towards Lindsay's ex-partner, Tim. At one point, he was a suspect in this case. He went through hell to clear his name, but fortunately and thankfully, the police proved that he had alibis. He was either at work or he was with family at the time of Lindsay's disappearance. All this is factually backed up, so we can rule Tim out. We can rule out any family members. Rocky... Marciano Price most, most certainly committed this, this murder on poor Lindsay. Lindsay Burbeck, who lived just off Burnley, or on Burnley Road, I should say, just off where the Whitaker's Arms pub is and the coppice, went out for her, her usual walk along the coppice, something she'd done many, many times before, something she's always felt safe in doing so. But yet on this one particular afternoon, on the 12th of August 2019, her life was cruelly taken away from her by a young boy. And let's not forget, Rocky is, or was, a young boy. He was 16 years of age at the time. What made him commit this crime, we don't know. He's never admitted to doing it. He's never given the police and the family any closure as to why he did it. Was it sexually motivated? Did he try to rape Lindsay? We just don't know the full, the full story behind why he committed such a brutal and tragic act on a defenceless, defenceless lady. A 16 year old boy, now okay, he might have had a low IQ, had an IQ of 65. People still know right from wrong. And even Vicky said, before we came out to cover this story, even Vicky said, 
he still had the thought of mind to try to dispose the body in the way he did by trying to dismember Lindsay's body. He also had the forethought to take a wheelie bin up to the coppice and walk around the coppice many, many times as a dry run, as the prosecutors would, would later in court say. So he had something about him, some, some kind of forward planning when it came to disposing of the body. But what made him commit the crime in the first place, none of us, other than Rock himself, will ever, ever know. Now the funeral of Lindsay Burbeck took place on the 20th of September 2019, and I think it was St Margaret's Church in Hapton. It was attended by thousands of people. The streets were lined to pay their respects to Lindsay Burbeck. After all, she was a heart of the community. You know, many people had been out to look for, for Lindsay during her disappearance. So you could say that a lot of people, it, it, you could say it hit them hard. The local community was hit hard by this terrible, terrible crime. So it was expected that obviously a lot of people would attend the service. Now straight after the service itself in Hapton, if from memory, I think there was a um, there was a family memorial and a crematorium that took place at Burnley Cemetery. So obviously that was just for a select few family members, such as the sons, the daughters, and obviously the ex, which was Tim, you know, and a few other family members. Now, Rocky's time in court or day in court will come to an end pretty much a year to the day after Lindsay went missing, and I think it was a year on the day. It was on Wednesday the 12th of August 2020 when Rocky Marciano Price would be brought to justice. He would be found guilty by a jury after four hours of deliberations and appearing via, I think it was a video link from, is it the HM prison in, over in Weatherby? He was now 17 years old and he never reacted when the foreman read out the verdicts. And two days later, on Friday the 14th of August, Rocky will be jailed for life by Judge Mrs. Justice Yip. He would have to serve a minimum tariff of 16 years in custody and would only be released when a parole board decides he is not a danger to the public. Justice Yip herself added, only conclusion I can draw is he was looking for a woman to kill. He lay in wait on the coppice near to Lindsay's home I don't know what was on his mind at the time. No evidence he had a weapon or equipped to kill. I am sure he had formed a murderous intent. She also st said, and she stated that Zoe Braithwaite, one of the witnesses, said she was lucky, but Lindsay was not. Mrs. Yip also continued, adding, why the defendant chose to kill Lindsay, only he knows. The evidence of the other woman demonstrates beyond doubt she was not targeted for any reason other than being a lone woman. This was the entirely random killing of a stranger and such killings are rare. Now as we leave Accrington Cemetery and we've retold the sad story of Lindsay Burbeck, this video was always going to be one of the most challenging ones and one of those videos me and Vicky spoke about doing for quite a while. However, it's a recent case. It's only two, two years old, three years old. And obviously we don't want to be disrespectful to the family of Lindsay Burbeck. We, we, you know, we, we're retelling this tale because we, like with all the other cases that we cover, the old cases, the, the century old cases, people should never be forgotten. And in the case of Lindsay, they always say time's a great healer, but also time can also make people forget about such crimes. Lindsay Burbeck, along with all the other stories that we've covered, is another crime that should never have happened. These things do happen, we know that, we understand that. What pushes and possesses another person to take the life of another human being? I don't think even psychologists know the true answer to that. What pushed Rocky Price, a 16 year old boy, to do something such brutal, such rage. The injuries on Lindsay proved that it wasn't just manslaughter, it wasn't an accident, it wasn't something that went horribly wrong. It was, it was brutal, it was forceful, it was rage. The injuries sustained to Lindsay's neck and then the forethought, or the afterthought I should say, to try to dismember 
Lindsay's body. A 16 year old boy. It, 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 honestly, it, it, it's really hard to comprehend and I'm struggling to find the words. But like I said at the start, me and Vicky, we, we struggled with this video. Um, Vicky's not appeared on this one. She has come out with me, with my two daughters. We've been to the coppice together. You may have seen her in and out of the video itself with the, with the family, but she didn't want to be in this video. She wanted me to do this on my own. Um, it's really difficult to find the words to this one. It really is, guys. Now, I do hope the, the Burbeck family are, 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 are sort of healing. I do hope that they're finding some closure to, to this horrible and horrendous time in their life. And our sympathies and our hearts go out to them as they do with all the other stories that we cover and the victims and the families involved. None more so than the Burbeck family. I can't imagine what they must have been going through during and after, obviously, the discovery of Lindsay's body. So my heart, my condolences go out to them. And I hope they, they don't find this video today offensive and I hope they don't, they don't think we've disrespected their mother in any way. Now guys, in the meantime, we're gonna leave Atkinson Cemetery. We do hope you've enjoyed the story itself and how we've presented it. Like I said, we hope we've not been disrespectful in any way, shape or form. But if if you do, or you did like this story and you do like the sort of content that we do, the darker side of life, please give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to comment down below on this tale and all the other tales that we've covered over the past. We do have a lot, lot more stories to come. But uh, don't forget to, like I said, give us a big thumbs up and comment down below. Don't forget to share the video as well because obviously it does help the channel grow immensely. But in the meantime, as I always say, and I always close these videos with the same saying, and I'll do that today. We want you to take care, we want you to look after yourselves, and we will be back soon with another tale from my dark, but at times, glorious past. Take care, guys.